Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your great love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace, who is Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you haven't left us wondering what you're like. For you said that if Jesus said that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus is the the perfect representation of God. And he is awesome. He is wonderful. And this morning we would ask that uh, you would reveal to us through your spirit who we are in Mr. Grace, Jesus Christ. That we would no longer walk in the things of this world, but that we would be transformed, that we'd be renewed in our minds to see Christ in us, the hope of glory. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're in a new series um, simply titled Amazing Grace. And... Grace sometimes doesn't seem to be all that amazing after you get the list of all the things that you must do. (laughs) do. And the reason why grace sometimes loses its amazement is because religion has taken grace and watered it down with a uh, DIY, do-it-yourself religion, mentality, gospel. And grace was never meant to be mixed. It was meant to be drank and straight. 120 proof. It's supposed to be potent. It's supposed to be world-shaking. It's supposed to be paradigm-shifting. It's supposed to be just, this is too good to be true. Because that's what the gospel means. The word gospel literally means news almost too good to be true. And is that the gospel that we hear? Is that the gospel that we proclaim? When we hear this gospel, do we we say, that can't be, that can't be true. That can't be right. You know, the Apostle Paul was was challenged many times. He wrote it. He says, so people say that we're just saying, just go ahead and sin so grace may abound. And he says, God forbid. If you're a Christian, you don't want to sin. If you do want to sin, guess what? You need to get born again. Because that is the new nature that has been put into you by the very grace of God. And last week, we seen that trying to keep the law in order to be righteous is as equivalent to eating from the tree of the knowledge of good, good and evil to be more like God. That if we could keep the law to be righteous, it's no different than Adam and Eve eating from the tree of the knowledge of good good and evil to be more like God. And it's ludicrous. It's absurd to think what was designed to reveal unrighteousness could could be in turn used to make you righteous. The law was designed to show man's unrighteousness, unability to be holy and righteous and blameless before God. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, all that did was reveal how much Adam and Eve weren't like God. And they were naked and ashamed. They felt condemned. They hid themselves from from the face of God. So just like it'd be crazy to go and continue to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to be more like God after it revealed how much more you're not like God. So too, how crazy it is to depend on the old covenant that God made with Israel and think that the law that was intended to show our guilt could ever make us righteous, could ever liberate us, could ever free us. Grace is the Greek word charis, or charis, if you want to 
pronounce it correctly. It is defined as the merciful love and grace by which God turns us to Christ, forgives us, keeps us, and strengthens us, and increases us in the blessing and inheritance of those who are in faith in Christ Jesus. See, grace is so much bigger than God just rescuing humanity. It also is the way he intended those that received the, his grace to live. See, we don't get saved by grace and then go to works. No, we get saved by grace and then we live in his grace, in his ability, in his strength, through the Spirit, through the Spirit. The just shall live by faith, right? The just shall live by faith. The justified, those that are righteous, those who have been justified before God, shall live by faith. Faith in what? Right, faith in God. Faith in God's amazing grace that was revealed in Jesus Christ. Faith in God providing a way for humanity to be one with him. Not faith in ourself. See, we need to renew our minds. We need to renew our minds. And to renew your mind is kind of like repentance. And religions turn repentance into a very hard thing, but really repentance is a very beautiful thing. So if you don't like something in your life, if you don't like how your life is going, if you think that your life is going down the wrong path, if you think your life is, is not what it should be, if that's what you think, guess what? Have a new thought. Because that's what repentance is. Repentance is turning and going in a different direction. I see myself this way. I see myself as a sinner. I see myself separated from God. I'm going to repent. I don't like that thought. I'm going to repent, and I'm going to go this way, and I'm going to see myself as righteous. I'm going to see myself as holy. I'm going to see myself as a child of God. I'm going to see myself in union with God. I'm going to see myself in the family of God. I'm going to see myself filled with the Holy Spirit and the power of God. That's what repentance is. It's renewing your mind to the truth of who you are. And that's the thing about grace, is that we were rescued by grace, but now we have to live in it. And if we have to live in it, guess what? We have a lot of renewing of the mind to do because we have a lot of the old ways. We have a lot of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that we have to get out of our life. We have a lot of religion that we have to get out of our life. We have an old covenant that, we, that, that wasn't even our covenant in the first place that we got to get out of our life. See, that's why Israel was called to repent. Repent from thinking that this is how we become right with God to seeing that now it's through Christ Jesus that we become right with God. And the Apostle Paul Paints a beautiful picture of that in Romans, right? But we're not going to go there today. But the Bible says that we need to renew our minds, but what does it actually mean to renew our minds? Because I've been told what it means to renew my minds, but I've come to the conclusion that I don't think that is a full and accurate idea of what it means to renew your mind. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore I urge you, brethren... By the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may be able to prove what, is the, will of, what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect." We need to, re to reveal what the will of God is for our life. The good, the acceptable and perfect will of God for you. And how do we do that? By renewing our mind, right? What does the word renewing mean? Because out of this whole thing, that's the key. We have to understand what renewing means before we can do it, right? Or how we do it. Before we can understand how to do it or to do it, we have to know what it means in the first place. What does the word renewing mean? 
I've heard that it means to reprogram. I've even taught this. You know, some things that you teach, you got to say, well, I didn't have a full revelation of it. But I've, been, I've always heard that it means to reprogram your mind with the Word of God. I'm not so sure that's completely accurate. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm, not, I'm just saying it's not a whole picture of what it means. I'm not saying also, because I don't want people to take me out of context. I'm not saying also it's not beneficial to spend time in the Word. Right? Because your, your spirit needs something to agree with. It's food. It's life. It's, it's the life of God. It's powerful. But that, that this way of renewing our mind is just incomplete. Furthermore, no word does it say that renewing the mind is actually the word of God. Have you ever thought about that? We've just assumed that renewing our minds meant reprogramming our brains, our carnal brains, with the word of God. See, there's a lot of people that's, knows the Bi- that know the Bible. There are people that know the Bible, and because it hasn't been mixed with faith, because it's not of the Spirit, it hasn't affected them at all. Some people can quote you scriptures from the Bible, have memorized passages of the Bible, and aren't even believers. So the Bible alone isn't what can renew someone's mind. Someone can have a mind filled with scripture and not have it affect them at all. And I think you know some people like that. <laughs> that they have the knowledge of the Word of God, but they don't have the actions of the Word of God. So that's interesting. That nowhere does it say that renewing your mind is, is a process of actually using the Word of God. The word renewing implies that something was new then became old, and now is becoming new again. When you renew something, right, it was new at one time, somehow it became old, and now it's in a process of being renewed. Right? It doesn't take a rocket scientist. Right? You got a 57 Chevy. At one time, it was brand new. Over a period of time, it's gotten rusty. The paint's faded. The seats are torn. The engine is mis- misfiring. I don't know anything about cars, so that's as far as I'm going to go. Then someone that knows something about cars and loves cars gets it and starts restoring it back to new. In the Greek, I'm going to murder this, Renewing is the word anakainos, A-N-A-K-A-I-N-O-S. It means to make new back or again. From kainos, K-A-I-N-O-S, meaning new. So it means back to new or new again. So this verse is saying that our mind was once new, Then it became old and now needs to be made new again. Well, what does that that mean? God is trying to get us back to his original intent. He's trying to get us back to the Garden of Eden. Jesus Christ is our genesis. He is our beginning. And God is trying to get us back to where Adam and Eve were before they fell. See, man's mind was once new before the fall. Then it became old because of the fall. And now it is in a state of being renewed to the state it was before the fall through the finished work of Christ. Well, what does that mean? When Adam and Eve were created, they were created in the image of God, correct? God created them in the image, in the image in his likeness. They were created as spiritual beings. Then then God clothed them in an earth suit. 
called flesh and gave them a natural mind. So Adam and Eve were spiritual beings. He clothed them in flesh to live on earth, and they give, and in that flesh they had a natural mind, a natural mind. Adam and Eve's mind and body were controlled by their spirit because their spirit was in a place of authority. Their spirit was in a place of union with God. And God designed them to control their natural mind and their physical body by their spirit. Understand? This means that their spirit was in charge and ruled over their mind and bodies. They had a spiritual consciousness, and this consciousness ruled over their mind and their body. The control center of their life that processed truths and thoughts and making decisions was located in their spirit, in their spirit. This is one of those teachings that you're going to have to go through again and again until you get it. Unfortunately, this shouldn't be deep, but it, 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 it is deep. But it shouldn't be deep. This should be the, a foundational teaching for a born-again believer to understand. Fully spirit conscious and fully God conscious, that's what Adam and Eve were. They could easily see between the spiritual and the natural realm, right? If you read Genesis, you can see that. They were led by their spirit and followed after God. They walked with God in the cool of the day. They spoke with God and heard him clearly. They could even see him. Have you ever noticed that for the majority of people that have experienced manifestations in experiences with God through visions, dreams, tangi tangible things that God does, it's not when they're watching TV. It's usually when they are in the Spirit. Peter on the roof was in the Spirit, and he fell into a trance and had a vision. When's the last time we've been in the Spirit? When's the last time we were walking in our renewed mind? They walked with God in the cool of the day. They also interacted with each other and ruled over the garden all from the Spirit through the mind and body. They were, of course, perfect in mind before the fall. They were perfect in mind and in their body was perfect. No corruption, no impurity in them, but it was not their mind or body that led them. It was their spirit, which was in perfect union with God. And this is a key point to understand. That they had a mind, they had a body, it was perfect, but that was not what led them. Their spirit is what led them. Their spirit that was in union with God. Are these phrases kind of kicking things in your mind about the new creation and you're one with Christ, and Christ is one with you, and we are in union with God, and we've been baptized, submerged into him. So how was Adam and Eve tempted to sin? Right? Because they were walking in the Spirit. They had an uncorruptible mind. They had an uncorruptible, uh, uncorruptible body. How were they tempted to sin? The serpent lured them away from being spirit conscious into mind and body consciousness. Genesis 3.6 says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from it from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband and he ate with her, and he ate also. I need to read it instead of tell you what I think it says. They were tempted through their mind and body. They were tempted through their flesh. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but from 
the world. Everything evil can be put into these three categories. Adam and Eve were tempted with the lust of the flesh, the hunger. It was good for food. The lust of the eyes, the tree was pleasant to the eyes. And the pride of life, the tree was desired to make one wise. They made a decision, not from their spirit, but from their mind and their body, their flesh. They were tempted through their mind and body. Jesus' temptation in the wilderness could also be categorized by these same three things. Turn this stone into bread, hunger. Jesus stayed in the spirit through his temptation in the wilderness, where Adam and Eve, they, they did not. Jesus was victorious, and Adam and Eve, they fell. See, Adam and Eve's spirits agreed with God, were subject to God, perfectly obeyed God, and had the nature of God in them. And the same is true with your spirits that have been born again. But they allowed their flesh to rule over their spirit, and they ended up sinning. So it's important to know that even if you have an uncorrupted mind, if you have an uncorrupted body, you can still sin. Adam and Eve had an uncorrupted, pure mind. They had an uncorrupted, pure body, and they sinned. Jesus Christ had an uncorrupted mind. He had an uncorrupted body. But he stayed in the spirit and sinned not. This is key. Adam and Eve Eve fell because they failed to stay in the spirit. Jesus was, was victorious because he did stay in the spirit. See, the spiritual realm is higher than the natural because everything natural was made by the spiritual. Adam and Eve were to rule over the natural by the spiritual. But when they sinned, they fell from the high place of the spiritual to the lower realm of the natural. They now related to everything, including God, through the natural realm. Welcome to religion. They went from having their spirits leading them to having a mind, their mind and their bodies leading them, to having the knowledge of good and evil leading them. Adam and Eve were the first people to be born again, but in the negative sense. Instead of being born into life, they were born into death. Instead of being born into light, they were born into darkness. Instead of being born into God, they were born into this world, in the God of this world. They lost Their God consciousness and became self-conscious, natural world conscious, mind conscious, and unspiritual. With their spirits detached from God, now they related to God through their minds. Their natural mind came to dominate their lives. Their minds moved from being new to becoming old. Their minds were new when they were subject to the spirit, and they became old when they became subject to the natural world, the corrupt natural world. As long as they walked in the spirit, they could know the mind of God and the will of God. When they fell, they went into the flesh and became unspiritual and were unable to discern God's perfect will. Their mind and body then became subject to decay in the degeneration of this natural world. Now under the curse and subject to the delusions, lies, and deceptions of the devil. But there's good news. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Where does sin come from? It comes from the desires of the flesh and your mind. 
and were by nature children of wrath just as others. We see here that all of humanity was spiritually dead and therefore darkened in their minds against God and was and what happened was a corresponding manifest behavior. That's why you should never be upset when people sin that aren't born again. Because they're just doing what they're born to do. You were born to be righteous. You were born to be holy. Because you have been born again, recreated in him. And we're going to find out what holy means. Most of us don't know what holy means. Holy, most people think that holy means your behavior. And holiness has nothing to do with behavior. That's just a teaser. We have been made alive in Christ. When we were born again, our spirit is made alive in God and it, it, made alive in God in Christ Jesus. And that and, ret and returns us to that high place of being spiritually minded. Look at what Ephesians goes on to say. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. Among whom also we were all once co conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, just as others. But God, but God, but God, I love when God puts his butt in our life. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love which with he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. This is a grace thing that has happened. By grace you have been saved, and he has raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we were once held captive by our carnal mind and, and the things of the world, but Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus, by his grace, has elevated us and seated us in heavenly realms with him. So if this is true, our spirits have been made alive with Christ and have come back to the high place of ruling over the natural body. So if that's true, and if we are in a, place, a high place with Christ Jesus, seated with him in heavenly places, why aren't Christians walking out the, perfectly, the perfect will of God in their lives. Let's look at Ephesians again. Verse 17. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind. You can't walk like unbelievers walk, being led around by your mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart, and they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. If you're led by your mind, eventually you will be turned over to sensuality and practice every kind of impurity and greediness. Verse 20, but you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as the truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life. See, this is the old in reference to this old manner of life, where was I? You lay, a uh, lay aside that old self, which is being corrupted, corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness, holiness, of the truth. You're born again. You have the Spirit of God living in, with, in you. He says you can't continue to walk the way that other people walk. You can't keep on thinking the way that other people are thinking. You can't keep on being led around by your four-pound organ that's in your brain, nor by your eyes, what you see, or your five physical senses. 
He says, you can't do that. You have, to, you have to take that old way, that old way of living off, and you have to put the new on. You have to put the new on. You have to choose to do this. You have to choose to distinguish between your, your carnal mind and the flesh and the spirit. We have to learn to walk in the cool of the day with God once again in our spirit. The reason, the reason why people aren't walking perfectly is that they are still operating by the old mind, that mind that is not subject to the Spirit. They aren't renewing their mind properly. Have you ever wondered why you've done all the things that they say for you to do? They, you, you read your Bible, you go to all the go to church, you go to the Bible studies, you do all this stuff, but for some reason, it's not changing your behavior. Sure, it changes your behavior when you're around other Christians, but when you're at home with your family, you're still a jerk. When you, your coworkers, they don't even know you're a Christian. And worst of all, in your heart, you have things and thoughts and and desires that you know you shouldn't have. This will set you free from that. When we don't renew our mind properly, we still have a mind-dominated consciousness rather than a spirit-dominated consciousness. Do you know that your spirit is saying things to you that are 180 degrees different from what your mind is telling you? Do you know that? The spirit is saying things to you. There are situations in your life where your mind is saying fear, panic, and your spirit is saying peace. Be still. Know who you are. Your Father loves you. Renewing the mind is simply learning to surrender your mind to your spirit and allowing the spirit to lead. It's all about the mind being renewed, put back in the right place order of things, to be put back in the right order before it fell, when the Spirit ruled over the mind and body. Transforma transformation is not about being, transformation is about being Spirit-led. You could paraphrase Romans 12 to this way, become Spirit-led by surrendering your mind that God's will can manifest through you. That is what it means to renew the mind. And when you walk in the spirit, in the renewed mind of your spirit man, the, the, the spirit that has the very mind of Christ, the Bible says, you will walk in the perfect, the perfect will of God in your life. We need to shift the control center. We need to shift the control center in our life. This is not just about reprogramming the carnal mind with scriptures, but shifting the spirit of our mind to being in control of our whole, our whole body. Your spirit knows truth. Jesus is truth. And the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, and the Holy Spirit dwells with you, with your spirit. The mind of Christ is absolute truth. When you live by your spirit in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, you will walk in absolute truth. You will know the difference between what is true and what is a lie. You will walk in the perfect will of God. You will know, if, you, if, if Adam and Eve stayed in the spirit, they would have known that, that in, in God, they were already like God. They wouldn't have been tempted to go outside of the perfect will of God for their life. Satan in the wilderness with Jesus 
actually used scriptures to tempt him. But by staying in the spirit, Jesus could see the truth from a lie. Have you ever known any Christians that use scriptures to justify their wrong behaviors? They're not walking in the spirit, and they're not operating in truth. If we lived by the spirit 100%, then we could walk in perfect truth, perfect love, perfect power, perfect soundness of mind, perfect passion for God, perfect obedience, and the perfect will of God. First Timothy, or Second Timothy, chapter 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Notice that the word spirit there is not capitalized. So it's talking about your spirit. Your born-again spirit is not a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. The more you walk in the spirit, lies will be exposed, fears are destroyed, paranoia and anxieties vanish, wrong patterns of thinking that are based on lies and falsehoods are exposed, truth is established in in us, and God flows unrestricted through us. How can I know if I'm in the Spirit? Do you have fear? Do you, are you paranoid? Do you have anxiety? God has not given us spirit of fear. Is it resting in the love of God? Is it resting in, in the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us? Is it, rest, is it resting in a sound mind that's at peace and is thinking soberly? So how about our behavior? Because, I mean, that's what everybody's interested in, right? You go to church. You go to church for behavior modification. We need to get you to act a certain way. What about behavior? Well, there's two ways that you can have the behavior of Christ. Through the old mind and the flesh, called religion, or through the spirit. Isn't having good behavior important? Because that's the whole focus of religion is to have good behavior, have acceptable behavior. We have to live right. We have to live moral. We have to live godly. Yes, I believe that God wants us to live right because that's what's best for us. But what is living right? What is living right? Is living right disciplining yourself to do certain things? Living right is walking in the Spirit and with faith in the finished work of Jesus. Living right is not about doing things. It's not about morality. It's not about being good. It's not about any of those things. It's about walking in the born-again Spirit man in faith with the finished work of Jesus Christ, believing that it's true. Why? Because by believing and walking in the Spirit, you're naturally going to have the behavior that follows the belief. We don't have to try to be good. You are good. You don't have to try to be righteous. You are righteous. You don't have to try to be moral. Morality lives within you because you have the Spirit of God. You have the nature of God. You are just like God in your spirit. The problem is we don't believe it. 
Because we haven't heard the gospel. We've heard that Jesus saves, but now it's up to you to stay saved. We heard that Jesus would t- take you to heaven one day, but until then, you would just grit and bear it d- down here on earth and try not to live like hell. The gospel proclaims that your spirit has been born again, reconnected with God. Colossians literally says that we have been engrafted into the very Trinity itself. How can that be? Because one part one third of the Trinity became a man. And he's for a man for all eternity. Jesus Christ didn't all of a sudden leave human, his humanity behind. He's a resurrected, firstborn from the dead, son of Adam, at the right hand of God. That's how much God loves us. That he wants to bring us into the fold of his family. That we are one with him. For all eternity, Jesus will still have the nail nail scars in his hand and the spear wound on his side. He's a man. And humanity has been wooed and pulled in to him. But do you believe it? You can't experience the benefits of of this awesome salvation, of this beautiful gospel, if you refuse to believe. All behavior is directly related to the level in which this is happening in your life. Do you know? People go through phases. And it's unfortunate, but it, but I've seen it. People go through phases, and they... Even I do. You go through phases where you're just really intimate with Jesus. You're really intimate with the Spirit. You're reading the Bible, but, but it's not just, uh, you're not reading the Bible because you feel like you've got to get your three chapters in today. You're reading the Bible and you're eating it. You're, you're loving it. You're, you're, you, you're in fellowship with God as you're doing it. And you're, you're, you praise God in the car. And you sing songs unto God, not because you have to, but it's just coming from in you. And I'm telling you that I can see it on people when they do those things. You are different when you are concentrating on the Spirit and who you are in the Spirit rather than the world and all the corruption that is in the world. Your Behavior is directly related to the level in which you are walking in the Spirit. And this isn't some weird, in-the-clouds type of life. God desired Adam and Eve to rule and work the garden through their spirit. Do you know that you can be in the Spirit? You can be in the Spirit on the job site. You can be in the Spirit in your home. And when you're in the Spirit, God will reveal things to you and make life a lot easier. How many times did, did you read in the Bible where it says that we were going to go to such and such town, but the Spirit forbid us? And then you have times when, when Paul was lowered down in the basket to escape persecution, and other times when he boldly stood up to persecution. You got to do it. And James talks about, don't say you're going to go to such and such town and buy and sell, but say, if the Lord wills, we will do such and such. How often do you say, Lord, do you will for me to do this? Or do we make our decisions based off our unrenewed mind and the flesh? There are some things that the world says it, says it just looks like the perfect deal. It's the best thing. I'd have to be stupid not to do this. I guess stu- stupid's a bad word, I guess. I don't know. But you would. It looks so good. But something in your spirit is saying, don't do it. Don't go, don't, don't do it, and you choose not to do it. And then all of a sudden the whole thing unravels, falls apart, 
and you were saved from it. There's been people that haven't took plane rides before. There's, there's people that's been, when 9-11 happened, there are testimony over testimony of people that for some reason in their spirit, they knew that God was saying, do not go into work this morning. And you're saying, so God loved them more? He didn't care about all those others? No, the spirit was screaming to all of them. But were they walking in the spirit? God is always screaming at you. God always wants the best for you. God is always desiring for you to walk in the spirit. But are we or are we walking in our unrenewed minds? I read a book and it it talked about two ways of developing character in your life. One is a false way. The other way is a genuine way. Let's look at the false way first. False character is birthed out of manipulation. It is pressure that is applied to people by others and even by themselves. You get this? This is something that we do internally to ourselves. This is, we, we internally can manipulate and apply pressure to our own selves to try to get our actions to go, be a certain way. That's called religion. That's called the knowledge of good and evil. It is pressure that is applied to people by others or even themselves that motivates their behavior based on promise, promises of blessings or curse, benefits or threats. Have you ever threatened yourself? Have you ever feared what might happen to you if you don't do such and such? Have you ever thought that maybe God thought to yourself, well, God, if I want God to answer my prayers, if, God, if I want God to move in my life, if I want God to bless me, then I need to, I need to do this, this, and this. Oh, I haven't done this and this and this, so I'm not going to be blessed. God's not going to answer that prayer. He's far from me. Have you ever done that? Yes, we have. We are applying pressure to ourselves. We're manipulating ourselves. Thought patterns get established in people's minds, whether Christian or not, that externally controls their behavior, but does not produce genuine internal character. You can be religious, you can be a Pharisee of Pharisees, like the Apostle Paul, and still not have an internal change in you, still be filled with dead men's bones. True character is in your spirit. It is actually God's character in you which flows to to and through your mind as your mind submits to your spirit. This is the kind of character that you want being established in your mind and through thought patterns as genuine character based on genuine motives. The law can make you look, look like you have good character when you do what it says to do, but does not have the power to produce that character in your, in your heart. We don't need a law if you're in the Spirit. Isn't that what Galatians says? You don't need laws when you're in the Spirit because your Spirit is the nature of God. So how do we renew our minds? Right? That's, that's what we need to know. Now that we know what renewing our minds is, we need to know how do we renew it. First, you start with a spirit that's born again. If you haven't been born again, if you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Savior, and if you haven't had a spiritual birthday, right? You have a physical birthday. You know what day your birthday is? You should have a spiritual birthday, a day where you say, Oh, my God, it's true. My God, you have so loved me. Jesus has come alive in me. You are my Savior. And it's not 
a natural thing. It's not through apologetics. It's not through winning an argument. It's a spiritual thing. It's something that happens within you. Your heart starts pounding. And for some reason, you don't have all the answers. You don't even understand it all. And actually, your mind telling you this is stupid, but for some reason in your heart, you know. That's your spirit. So you've got to start with being born again. Then you need to become aware of your spirit. By finding out the truth about your spirit and awakening your mind to your spirit, you have to start thinking this way, that I am a spirit being. I'm different from other Gentiles that walk in the vanity of their minds. I am a spirit being. Number two, then you need to, (coughs) excuse me, then you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, yes. The Holy Spirit comes in and transforms your spirit and and, and remakes your spirit to the very likeness of God. But then you have to awaken to the truth that God has given his Holy Spirit to live and dwell and come upon you in power. To have fellowship with, to walk with, to never be left alone, never left forsaken. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He'll make you aware of your spirit and activate the life of God in you. He is, the, he is God, the Holy Spirit, living in you. He is the spirit of truth. He awakens spiritual life in us. We can be aware of his presence throughout the day. So as a spiritual being, filled with the Holy Spirit, the very nature, the God himself dwelling with us, We should be constantly aware of the presence of God throughout the day as you're doing dishes, as you're changing the oil on the car, as you're typing on the computer, as you're you're serving at the restaurant, or you're serving through your workplace, or you're teaching the students in the classroom, or you're ministering on the operating table, that the Holy Spirit is with you. Constantly speaking to you, leading you into all truth, showing you things to come. Number three, this is the scary one. Not if not if you're come out of the carnal mind. Number three, pray in tongues. First Corinthians, go study it out. First Corinthians chapter 14 and Jude 120. Forget what, about what man has said to you. Go and read your Bible. It says that he that prays in an unknown tongue prays not unto men but unto God. And it talks about it builds your inner man up and causes you to be spiritual conscious. There's nothing more There's nothing you could do greater than pray in the Spirit to get your mind off the things of the world, to get your mind off carnally thinking, to get your mind off the flesh. This is a great gift that God has given us to make us aware of our spirit, to allow our spirit to pray. And I'm talking about by yourself, at home, in your car, on your breath at work, those types of instances. To make yourself, that's what this is for. This is, a, this is a tool used for you to renew your mind. To edify and build up yourself. Your mind, your carnal mind will say, that's stupid. That's gibberish. I feel dumb. Am I actually saying anything? Is it, am I just wasting my time? You know what? If it's in faith, I don't care if it is gibberish and you're not saying nothing. God honors faith. If you're trusting and believing in God and you're taking your mind off the carnal and putting it on the spiritual, you're going to reap benefits from it because this is what this is all about. It's about transforming our minds, renewing our minds from an old carnal way of thinking where our minds and our flesh controlled the way that we lived to a spiritual way of thinking, where our spirit tells our mind, no, this is the way you're going to think. Body, this is what we're going to do. 
So we pray in the Spirit. And praying in the Spirit, listen, it's not for the super dupers. It's for the body of Christ. Anybody that wants to pray in the Spirit, you can pray in the Spirit. Well, Chad, I don't pray in the Spirit. Yes, well, start. Well, how do I start? Say stuff out loud. That is not English. Well, that's stupid. Yeah, welcome. Yeah, it's stupid. But it takes a step of faith. Just say stuff that isn't English. Sound like a baby. Sound like baby talk. Sounds sound goofy. But pretty soon, it'll start flowing. Number four, prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. Religion tries to get us to think that we need to fast and we need to pray to get God to move. God moved 2,000 years ago. God has already moved. We don't need to fast and pray for revival in the land. God wants revival in the land more than you do. That's the problem. We don't truly want revival. Because if you read any revival that's ever happened, everything stops. You won't be able to go to your sporting events anymore. You won't be able to read your Facebook. You won't be able to binge watch on Netflix. You're not going to be able to do all that stuff if revival happens. God wants revival, but this church does not. We don't have time for revival. You know, who? what was it? It was in Sweden. I can't think of it right now. I shouldn't even say it. No, I can't think. But there was a revival where the, the soccer tournament, which would be comparable to our Super Bowl, was canceled because of revival. And it literally says that revival took place that year and it didn't happen. There was a revival that they had to get rid of all their mules in the mines because all the miners got born again and saved and the mules only obeyed their previous um, instructions, which was curse words. And the miners stopped cursing, and the mules didn't know what to do anymore. See, revival is very inconvenient. But God wants revival. So what is prayer and fasting for? If, if prayer and fasting isn't to get God to move, what's it for? It's to bring your flesh under subjection so you can hear the Spirit of God. The sole purpose is for you to get in the Spirit so you are more in tune with the Spirit. And there's nothing greater that you can do than to cut off the old esophagus to the gut to make your flesh start screaming. They'll start telling you we're going to die. You're going to get sick. And, it, it, and you, your, your spirit say, has to say, no, we will not. You will not eat. And all of a sudden, I don't know if you ever did a fast before, but all of a sudden you're going to notice it stops screaming. It gives up. You know, you can do the same thing with a sin or a habit, a bad habit you have in your life that you can't break this habit, but just fast it. Tell your flesh that the Spirit's in control for the next 30 days, and I'm fasting it. I'm going to tell you who controls me and what controls me. You're free in your spirit. Number five, soak in God's glory, his presence. The more you do, the more you'll walk conscious of the spirit realm. We need to spend times, and, you know, sometimes I wonder if, we're do, if we do church right. <laughs> we need to learn to sit and soak in God's presence. All of these things that I'm telling you right now, are going to make your natural mind and your flesh very uncomfortable. 
We don't like silence, especially if it's in a large group. We don't like to wait on God. We don't like to, to sit in the presence of God. If we worship longer than 30 minutes, our spirits are so weak, or our flesh is so weak that we can't take it. Do you, do you, see, do you see how much we are controlled by our minds and our flesh? We haven't renewed our minds to the mind of the Spirit. Learn to discern between your minds and spirit and go with your spirit. How do you, how, th that's where the Bible is a great, great tool. Because it says that the Word of God is living and po powerful and sharper than a two edged sword dividing amongst the soul and the spirit. The Word of God agrees with what your spirit's saying. And it says that the Bible is a mirror to see ourselves in it. And, he said, and James talks about how stupid it is for a man to see himself in a mirror and then walk away and forget what manner of man he was. Seven, continue learning about these things. Learn to walk in the Spirit. Get teaching. Find, find people that... that you see our spirit led and, and the spirit of God is moving in their life and, and things are happening in their life. And listen to their messages. Listen to their teachings. Get a book and read it. I don't, I don't read yet. Oh, your spirit does. Stop saying you don't read. Reading's not for me. Make Your flesh is telling you that. Your, your unrenewed mind is telling you that. It's a lie. You love reading. You don't even know it, but you love reading. Continue learning about these things. This isn't something we can't just teach on this Sunday, and then you guys walk out the door and expect to walk in it. Nine, have constant encounters with God. I didn't like that one. No. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Have constant encounters with God. What does that mean? It means don't forsake the assembly of, together, uh, of the believers. And not, uh, above that, find conferences. Find, find places where the body as a whole is getting together and worshiping and praising God, and, and, and our teaching on God, and the gifts of the Spirit is moving. Go on vacation. You go on vacation, and include God in it. Show up at a conference. My, my flesh doesn't want to do that. That don't sound like fun. Well, you're not supposed to be walking in your old mind. And listen to me. Once you tame your, your mind... With the Spirit, you're going to find out you, there's a lot of things that are fun that you never thought were fun before. Get, a, get, a other, get together with other believers and have encounters with God. Get together and intercede for the church, intercede for our community, intercede for, for people. Pray, prophesy to one another, build each other up. Ex invite the Holy Spirit to be there. Have small groups, Bible studies in your homes. Do you, do you, do you see, do you, are you getting a picture, a revelation of how unrenewed our minds are, how much we do not walk in the Spirit, and how much our old nature, our old way of thinking, our minds and our flesh are dictating to our lives how we're going to live? And if you don't like how your life is going, why not try it God's way? I'm not saying you're not going to heaven. I'm just saying you're not going to experience it here on earth. So in closing, there are four stages that God wants to do to humanity's mind. That God has done in humanity, and he's going to do in humanity as concerning our minds. 
Number one, before the fall, man's mind, humanity's mind was a new mind. And it was spirit conscious, had spirit consciousness. Number two, after the fall, the old mind, and they became mind conscious, physical conscious, body conscious, five physical senses conscious. Number three, after redemption, a renewing mind is in humanity. A renewing mind, changing from mind consciousness to spiritual consciousness. And that's where we're at right now. And to the point that you do that, put on the new man that is in Christ Jesus and put off the old man. As we do that, you're going to see God's perfect will be manifest in your life. And then number four, what a day this will be after the glorification, at the return of Christ. At the return of Christ, we'll have a renewed mind, total spirit consciousness in perfect harmony with a perfect mind in a perfect body. It's, that's been God's intent from the very beginning. Amen? Amen. I hope you guys got some out of this this morning. I know it's something that we're going to have to go, you're going to have to go over and over and over again, but that's part of the process of seeing yourself in the spirit and not in the flesh. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that it's by grace that we have been saved, and it's by grace in which we live. We live in the grace of God. We live in the spirit of God. We live in that empowering ability that you have given us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, this morning, we thank you that you have showed us the way of life, and the way of life is to renew our minds, to walk in the Spirit, and not gratify the lusts of the flesh. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've given us God, the Holy Spirit, to live with us daily. Awaken us to that reality that we have a friend in him that wants to lead us, that he wants to guide us. He wants to, he wants to be intimate with us. He wants to speak with us. He wants to have a relationship with us. He wants to show us things to, to come. He wants to give us success and give us wisdom and empower us to walk out the truth of Christ. Father, we thank you. We thank you that one day you will put all things right and we will have a renewed mind with a perfect body and a perfect physical mind that is in union with the Spirit of God perfectly. But you wait. You wait because you desire that all men might be saved. So help us to walk out your kingdom in this earth. Help us to be ambassadors in this earth. Help us to show a better way. Help us to be the salt and the light of the world through the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, church.